today's lecture is on the asymptotic properties of M estimators. This lecture is the second in our sequence of lectures on nonlinear estimation methods. In our first lecture of the sequence, we introduced the M estimation framework and used as our primary and motivating example nonlinear regression and the associated estimator known as the nonlinear least squares estimator. In this lecture, we proceed to analyzing the asymptotic properties of M estimators in more generality. In the, in the next lecture, we'll then round off our M estimation talk by discussing methods for doing inference within the M estimation framework. All right, so just to recap, the setting that we're studying goes as follows. We have an M estimate given by the true parameter or theta naught in our notation, which is assumed to solve which is assumed to so solve a population problem, or PP for short. This population problem has a particular structure in that the criterion function, or population minimum, takes the form of an expectation over some function Q, where the expectation with respect to our observables W, which may include an outcome and regressors, say, and minimization is over all possible candidate parameters, theta belonging to some parameter space, capital theta. Now, given that our M estimate, our parameter of interest, can be framed as the solution to such a population problem, with a minimizer of such a population problem, the analogy principle suggests replacing this expectation with a sample average and solving the resulting sample problem, or SP for short. And we defined any solution to such a sample problem as an M estimator. In this lecture, having defined our M estimate and M estimator, we move on to discussing the properties of M estimation. Specifically, in this lecture, we'll, we'll develop methods and arguments for establishing consistency of the M estimation method. Adding additional assumptions, we'll be able to establish a result of asymptotic normality, and we'll, de we'll derive the structure of the associated asymptotic variance. In the next lecture, we'll then discuss methods for establishing, or rather estimating, the asymptotic variance, which will be used in various inference procedures. But let's first talk about consistency. Now, before getting too caught up in all the mathematics and formality, let's just do an informal look at consistency. So here I've gathered the elements of our framework as introduced a couple of slides ago. In the top row, I've gathered the various minimums or criterion functions, the guys that we're minimizing in the sample and population respectively. In the bottom, I've gathered the M estimator and M estimate, what we're trying to estimate. First, Let's just remind ourselves, what are the relationships between these variables? And can we establish further relationships between the four of them? Well, first of all, by definition of our M estimate, theta naught is a minimizer of the population objective function or population minimum. And by our definition of the M estimator, it is also a minimizer, this time of the sample objective function, or sample minimum, if you will. Now for a given value of theta, or by that I mean for a fixed value of theta, the sample criterion function at that particular theta is just an average over 
iid random variables. So we may invoke the law of large numbers to establish that as the sample size grows without bound, this average converges to the common mean, which is the expected value of q of w and theta, the same point of evaluation. It therefore seems reasonable that this convergence between the sample Cartesian function or the convergence from the sample Cartesian function to the population equivalent should be inherited by the solution of the sample criterion function, or sample problem, rather. Now, having discussed these relationships in an informal manner, we see that our question of whether or not M estimation is consistent boils down to when the minimum convergence under what circumstances the minimum converges in the top row implies minimizer convergence, where both of these convergence concepts are in probability. We next take a formal look at consistency. That is, when is the M estimator, or sequence of M estimators, rather, consistent for the M estimate? It turns out that it's sufficient that two conditions hold, which I here list. The first condition is that the M estimate, or true parameter, is identified. The second is a bit more complicated to state. But in words, it says that the sample minimum, or sample criterion function, converges to the population equivalent, that is the population criterion function where this convergence is uniform in probability. Written mathematically, uniform convergence of, of the sample criterion function to the population equivalent in probability can be expressed symbolically as this. Now, if we were just looking at a fixed theta, which is what's going on inside these absolute values, we would have no trouble establishing that the difference between the sample criterion function at theta and the population equivalent at the same theta converges to zero in probability. That's simply the law of large numbers. But we're now talking about whether this convergence takes place not for a fixed theta, but jointly over all candidate parameters, as represented by the parameter space capital theta, and this maximum over the difference between the two functions. Hence, what we're trying to establish is not a law of large numbers, which was what we invoked for a fixed theta, but a uniform law of large numbers. Having these two conditions in mind, we now discuss them in, slight, in slightly more detail. Now at this level of, of abstraction, where we've assent, we essentially have no structure to work with, we'll simply go ahead and assume that identification holds. That is, we'll assume that theta naught is the unique minimizer of the population criterion function. That is, for any candidate theta different than the true one, the population criterion yields a larger value. So for now, we're simply assuming that the true theta, theta naught, is the unique solution to the population problem. This, seem, they may, this may seem like a rather abstract assumption, and it is a rather abstract assumption, but later on, when we look at specific applications, we can make this assumption less abstract and invoke less or less abstract, or some would say more primitive assumptions, yielding identification. But more on that later. When, the, when it comes to the second conditions that we'll invoke for establishing consistency, 
that is, when it comes to establishing a uniform law of large numbers, we may invoke more primitive conditions and deduce this type of minimum convergence. Here I'm restating a theorem of Woldrich, which gives sufficient conditions for a uniform law of large numbers to apply. Essentially, uni a uniform law of large numbers holds essentially under two assumptions. The first is the assumption that the parameter space, capital theta, is compact, which in our setting means that it is both a closed and bounded set. The second states that the Q function that we're referring to throughout is continuous in its second argument. That is, viewed as a function of theta, no matter the value of w, it is continuous on the parameter space. That is, it is continuous in theta throughout capital theta. Provided these two conditions hold, and also some additional technical conditions, which we will not worry about in this course, one may establish a uniform law of large numbers. That is, one may establish that the sample criterion function, viewed as a function of theta, converges uniformly in probability to its population equivalent. With these ingredients in mind, we can establish or go through a slightly more formal consistency argument. So here's a proof sketch. Now, under the assumptions of our yielding the uniform law of large numbers, that is, under the assumptions of this theorem of compact, compact parameter space and a Q function continuous in theta, one may show that a solution to the sample problem exists. Why is that? Well, it turns out that this is an application of the extreme value theorem, or Weierstrass's theorem, if you will. Namely, specifically, this theorem states that a continuous function with domain given by a compact set attains its extreme values. And in particular, it attains its minimum. In our case, if Q is continuous, then so is the average over Q, the average of Qs when evaluated at different Wis. So the average of Qs, which is our sample objective function, with if it has a compact domain theta, there must be a solution to the sample problem. Now, under the same two assumptions, we know that a uniform law of large numbers applies such that in the limit, the sample and population minimums, or criterion functions, coincide. Our assumption of identification states that there's a unique solution to the population problem. So by the two, the two criteria, criterion functions coinciding in the limit, we must have that the solution to the sample problem converges to the population solution. Now, these statements are really probabilistic statements such that the convergence concept we have in mind is convergence in probability, which is to say that this, this sketch is a sketch of consistency. Our sketch on the previous slide essentially establishes a consistency theorem. This theorem is also stated in the book but here I repeat it for convenience. So under the assumptions of our earlier theorem, yielding a uniform law of large numbers, so these were the assumptions of a compact parameter space and a Q function which was continuous in theta, and also assuming identification of the true parameter then one may conclude two things. First, there's a solution to the sample problem. That is, 
our m estimator solves the sample problem and also our sequence of m estimators is consistent for our m estimate the true parameter this theorem or voltage's theorem 12.2 gives us sufficient conditions for consistency of m estimation that is it gives us conditions which we could think about verifying in specific cases so it'll be a useful reference for later applications of the, in the course the next handful of slides or so will illustrate why these conditions cannot be relaxed in general specifically this example is intended to show the necessity of the uniform convergence for this example we don't need any sort of stochasticity that is we will simply consider a deterministic sequence of functions these functions should be thought of as playing the role of the sample minimums or sample criterion functions so consider a deterministic sequence of functions that is a sequence of fn's where fn as a function of a scalar theta is piecewise constant with three pieces it is equal to one half at zero then it's zero at n and otherwise one now since it's piecewise constant it's especially easy to find its to find its minimum and minimizer direct inspection shows that the smallest value that fn takes on on the real line is zero which happens at theta equal to n since it happens at theta equal to n alone the argument the argument of fn is simply n so this here we may think of as theta n which is notation for the argmin of the sample problem here we could have a hat or not since there's no stochasticity indicating randomness all right for any fixed value of theta one may one can see that the sequence of fn's evaluated at that at a particular theta converges and the convergence is to a limit function let's call it f which takes the following form specifically f is of a, is also of a piecewise constant form now only having two pieces it is equal to one half at zero and otherwise equal to one again since f is piecewise constant it's especially easy to find its minimizer its minimum and minimizer we direct inspection here shows that the minimum is one half which is attained at zero and zero alone hence the arc min of f is zero now here zero plays the role of the m estimate so let me put this in quotes throughout note here that if we look at the sequence of minimizers of the of the sample problem if you will i'm doing air quotes by myself here then this sequence is simply the sequence of natural numbers which as n increases does not go to zero it goes to infinity as n grows without bound hence the sequ sequence of minimizers does not converge to the minimizer of the limit function in fact the sequence of minimizers or the sequence of minimizers grows without bound which make we could visualize as the minimizer escaping to the horizon graphically the example looks, looks something like this 
the limit function f is piecewise constant. At 0, it's 0.5, and it's otherwise equal to 1. The first function in our sequence of functions is f1. Here I've overlaid, where I'm here overlaying the graph of x, f1, in the previous plot. Now this overlay highlights that the two functions coincide at all points except at one single point, namely 1. At this particular point, f1 is 0, as indicated by this solid dot, while f, the limit function, is 1. If we look at the next sequence of our sequence of functions, f2, we see that, again, this function coincides with the limit function, except at a single point, this time the single point being 2. Again, the difference between the two functions is 1. And the same goes for the third sequence, a third element in a sequence of functions. The two, it, it's different from the limit function at a single point, this time being the point 3. And one can imagine the same plots or the same pictures for each and every element of the sequence, which shows that the two functions differ at one point and one point only and the difference being 1. So what's the problem here? Why don't we see minimizer convergence? The problem at its core is that convergence isn't sufficiently uniform. Now, If we look at the difference between these two functions, we see that they coincide at each point except at 1. They coincide everywhere except at a single point. That is, the difference between the two occurs at a single point, which is n. And the difference at that point, that is the vertical distance between the two graphs, is 1 at that point. Now the maximum difference between the two is therefore the max over this indicator of the point in question, which is the indicator for theta being equal to n. Now since for any n, we can simply, we can simply uh, achieve this difference between the two functions by setting theta equal to n, we see that the difference between the two graphs is 1 for all n. Hence the, the maximum difference between the two, between fn and f, is bounded away from 0. That is, it does not converge to 0 as n grows without bound. Now this example here illustrating a lack of uniform convergence was done in a deterministic setting in order to keep things simple and manageable. But you can imagine this exact same problem arising in a stochastic setting. Now, why doesn't this problem show up in our argument establishing consistency? Well, the truth here is that in that case, our example is ruled out by our condition or assumption of compactness. Specifically, in the example, the implicit candidate parameter space, or capital theta, was the entire real line, which is an unbounded set. Since it's unbounded, it is not compact. We next move on to discussing conditions under which the sequence of m estimators is asymptotically normal. Up to this point, we've argued for consistency, and in the process we've invoked 
a number of assumptions. Specifically, we've assumed that the true parameter theta naught is identified. That is, it is the unique minimizer of the population objective function. We've assumed that the parameter space, capital theta, is a compact set. And we've assumed that Q, when viewed as a function in theta, is continuous, plus some technical stuff. If you want to establish the stronger property of asymptotic normality, we'll have to invoke, and we will invoke, some stronger assumptions. So let's do that in a couple of steps here. So in order to establish asymptotic normality, we'll first add these two assumptions. Now the first assumption states that theta naught, the true parameter, is interior to the parameter space, capital theta. Note that this implies that the interior of the parameter space must be a non-empty set, as otherwise theta naught could not be in it. The second assumption states that not only is Q a continuous function in theta, but it is in fact twice continuously differentiable on the interior of the parameter space. Now, why do we assume these two things? Or why do we make, how do we make use of these two assumptions? First, the assumption of interiority of the true parameter is used to expand around this parameter. And the particular type of expansion we'll, we'll make use of is a second order expansion, which is then facilitated by our assumption of second order continuous differentiability. Now, in order to state the relevant expansion, as well as our theorem concerning asymptotic normality, we'll, we'll need some additional notation. Or at least it'll be helpful to have some additional notation. So let's abbreviate the vector of partial derivatives of Q with respect to theta. Let's abbreviate that by S, which, which we'll refer to as the score function. Here, this vector is P by one, which means that when we're looking at the vector of partial derivatives, we're looking at the transpose of the gradient of Q with respect to theta. Let's also introduce some notation for the second order derivative of Q, as written down here, which is a P by P matrix. We'll call that capital H, where the H connotes Hessian. So H is for Hessian. Now the two assumptions that we'll add go as follows. We'll assume that the score function upon evaluating at the true theta, the score is mean zero. We'll also assume that the Hessian function, upon evaluating at the true parameter, the expectation of this Hessian is a positive definite matrix. Remember, this was P by P. Now, how should we think about these two assumptions? Well, let's just spend a moment on the first one. Now, if theta naught, going back to our assumption of identification, we've assumed that theta naught is the unique minimizer of the population criterion function. That is, it's the unique solution to the population problem. Now, if theta naught is in fact interior to theta, then it must be that the first order condition for minimization holds, which means that the partial derivative of this function, 
which is just the derivative with respect to theta, since it only depends on theta. This partial derivative evaluated at theta naught must be equal to zero. Now, in order to see the difference between this statement and our assumption, we see that the two only differ in terms of the order of differentiation and expectation. Hence, the assumption of a zero mean score amounts to an assumption of whether or not we can interchange the order of differentiation and expectation, which we may under some relatively mild conditions. However, here we simply state as an assumption that the scores are mean zero. One can similarly relate the assumption of a an expected Hessian being positive definite to the second order sufficient condition for minimization. But here I'll skip it. Now with these two definitions and assumptions in mind, we can actually state a theorem of asymptotic normality of MS debaters. The theorem goes as follows. Assuming that the true theta is identified, as well as interior to the parameter space, which is taken to be a compact set, and also assuming that the Q function involved in the M estimate and estimation problem is both continuous, as we assumed before, continuous in theta, as well as twice continuously differentiable on the interior of the parameter space, and assuming that the scores have zero expectation and the Hessian being positive definite in expectation, plus some technical stuff, which we again will ignore for the purposes of this course, the M estimator or sequence of M estimators centered at theta naught, the true parameter, and then scaled by the square root of the sample size, converges in distribution to a normal, which is zero mean and has a variance of the sandwich form. Now here, the ingredients entering the variance sandwich are A0 and B0, where A0, which we may think of as the inverse of the bread of the sandwich, is the expectation of the Hessian at theta naught. Now B, the meat of the sandwich, if you will, is the expectation of the product or outer product of the score vectors. So this theorem may be used to establish asymptotic normality of any M estimator subject to these assumptions. Now we'll spend the next handful of slides or so actually going over or sketching the argument yielding asymptotic normality of M estimators. For this purpose, we'll need a mean value theorem. Now in order to keep things simple in stating the mean value theorem, as well as going through our proof sketch, we'll assume that theta is scalar, that is, P is one which is why there's no both phase theta, just a normal phased theta. Now recall that a mean value, the, the mean value theorem for our purposes, or MVT for short, goes as follows. If F is a function on a closed line segment, which is both continuous as well as differentiable on the open line segment, then there's some value in between the two endpoints, let's call it C, such that the difference in outputs is equal to the difference in inputs up to the derivative of F at that intermediate value. Now, one way of rephrasing or restating the mean value theorem in words is by dividing by B minus A, 
that is dividing by b minus a, putting it to the left-hand side, which then yields the slope of the secant line. That is the slope of the point, the slope arising from connecting the two points on the graph of f between a and b. So it's the slope of this line. And what the mean value theorem is then telling us is that the slope of the secant line, or the slope of the secant, is attained somewhere in between the two endpoints, at least when f is continuous and continuously differentiable in between. In order to make use of the mean value theorem, let's just recall our definition of the score in Hessian. In the scalar case, the score function is a univariate function, or scalar function, rather, which is given by simply the partial derivative of q with respect to theta, which again is a scalar for now. The Hessian is similarly a scalar, and in our current setting, it's the second order partial derivative of q with respect to theta which is also the partial derivative of s with respect to theta. Now, assuming, making the assumption that q is twice continuously differentiable, we know that s is once continuously differentiable. Hence, S is a candidate for the mean value theorem. Now, so is the average of the S's, which is similarly once continuously differentiable. Hence, we could, we could and will apply the mean value theorem using as our F function the average of the scores. Now, what the mean value theorem tells us is that if we use as our endpoints, the m estimator and m estimates, then there's some point in between the two, let's call it theta bar, such that the average score at theta hat is equal to the average score at theta naught, up to a term which is given by the average Hessian at the intermediate point. It's given by the product of the difference between the m-estimator and m-estimate, and the average Hessian at the intermediate point. So that's what the mean value theorem tells us. Now we know a bit more because we've defined theta hat as a solution to the sample problem. Hence, we know that theta hat must satisfy the first order condition for minimization. Right? Now, the first order condition for minimization in the sample problem states that the average of the derivatives of q with respect to theta is equal to zero. And we know that our m estimator satisfies this. But the derivative of q is exactly the score function, so the average of the scores at the m estimator must be zero. As a result, the left-hand side of this expression must be zero. Now next we'll isolate the difference between the m estimator and m estimate in order by dividing by this average Hessian at the intermediate point. Now, in we're still while we're still in the scalar case, I do want to mention that when we're talking about division in the vector setting, or in that case with a matrix Hessian, by division I mean inversion or matrix inversion. 
Now, up to this point, we've argued the following. We can express, we've shown that under the conditions of the theorem, the average of the scores at the true parameter plus the, the product of the difference between the M estimator and M estimate and the average Hessian at an intermediate point, somewhere in between the two, is equal to zero. Now, if we divide by this average Hessian, for now assuming that it's not a zero, and multiplying the result by the square root of the sample size, we can express the difference between the M estimator and theta naught, scaled by the square root of the sample size, as the product of two terms, one being the inverse of the average of a Hessian at the intermediate point, and the other being the scaled average of scores at the true theta. We next isolate each of these, or rather, we next analyze each of these right-hand side factors in turn. First, we consider the first factor, which was the factor involving an inverse over an average of Hessians at a point somewhere in between the M estimator and M estimate. Now, we know that our conditions for the conditions for the current theorem were stronger than the conditions for consistency. That is, we're still assuming identification, a compact parameter space, and continuity of Q with respect to theta. Hence, the M estimator is consistent. That is, we still have, we still have enough assumptions in order to argue that theta hat converges in probability to theta naught. Now we also know by the, another takeaway from the mean value theorem is that since theta bar is trapped in between the M estimator and M estimate, and the M estimator converges to the M estimate, then so must this intermediate value, that is theta bar, must also be consistent for theta naught. With this observation in mind, it seems reasonable that the average of the Hessians evaluated at the intermediate point should be close to the average of the same Hessians, except that we are now evaluating at the true theta. And this turns out to be true, at least in some sense, under the technical assumptions of the theorem, which I'm here skipping. But if we are willing to swallow this pill, then we can replace this average of Hessians at the intermediate point with the average of Hessians at the true theta. But this is, again, just an average of IID random variables, such that by the law of large numbers, this average converges in probability to the corresponding expectation. That is, it converges in probability to the expected Hessian at theta naught, which in stating the theorem, we gave the name A naught. Now, under the assumptions of the theorem, or one of the assumptions of the theorem, was that this expected Hessian was positive definite, thus implying that A naught is a positive number, since it is just since positive definiteness of a scalar just means positive. Now with this, these convergences in place, we can invoke Slutsky's theorem to argue that the inverse of this average of Hessians converges in probability to the corresponding inverse, that is, 1 over A naught. Our case our scalar case, this would just be 1 over A naught, which makes sense because A is not zero. 
Here I'm writing everything using inverses in order to draw par parallel in order to draw parallel to the vector case, in which case we are dealing with a matrix on both sides. Next, we consider the second part of the product. That is, we consider the scaled average of the scores evaluated at the true parameter theta naught. Now, if we've assumed that these scores at mean zero, so what we're dealing with is a scaled average of mean zero variables. We can therefore appeal to the central limit theorem, a scalar version of the central limit theorem, to argue that this scaled average of mean zero variables converges in distribution to a normal, which is mean zero, with variance B naught being equal to the variance of the scores. So here we don't actually need the i here, since all of the wi's have the same distribution. Now in the, the only difference between the scalar case and the vector case here is that the when we're dealing with a score which is a vector, squaring becomes an outer product. All right. So what have we shown? Let's summarize our findings thus far. We've expressed the difference between the M estimator and M estimate when scaled by the sample size or square root of the sample size as the product of two terms. The first term being the inverse of an average Hessian, which we've shown converges in probability to the to one over the expected Hessian at theta naught. The other part of the product is a scaled average of mean zero random variables given by these scores, which therefore converges in distribution to a mean zero normal with some variance beta naught given by the variance of the scores. Combining these two findings and invoking our product rule, which we introduced in lecture one, we can therefore conclude that this centered and scaled M estimator, or viewed as a sequence, as the sample size grows without bound, the dis it converges in distribution to a normal, which has a variance of the sandwich form. Now in our scalar case, the sandwich form is really just B naught over the square of A naught. But here I'm keeping in line with the notation that we, that we need for the vector case. All right, so this ends our sketch of the proof of asymptotic normality with a scalar theta. Extending the proof to the case of a vector theta is relatively straightforward, albeit notationally somewhat more complicated. Now we still need, we'll still use the same overall steps. The first step being that we invoke a mean value theorem, this time a vector type of mean value theorem, which yields therefore a linear approximation. Now we can use our linear approximation to isolate the difference between the M estimator and M estimate scaled by the square root of the sample size and borrow their, borrow their asymptotic properties into the properties of, two, of these two products or the product of these two components. Except that we are now dealing with a matrix H and a vector S. Now we can establish under the assumptions of the theorem, we can establish convergence of the inverse Hessian term by means of 
a law of large numbers, essentially, and our assumption of positive definiteness of the expected Hessian. And we can establish convergence and distribution of the scaled average of scores by means of a centered limit theorem, which this time is a, lim a multivariate central limit theorem. We can then again invoke the product rule in order to combine the two in order to arrive at our final, final claim, which was asymptotic normality of the product. All right, so what we've done in this lecture is to come up with methods for establishing consistency as well as asymptotic normality of any M estimator. Which is very useful later on when, when considering particular example M estimators. What we've seen, or another conclusion from the theorem yielding asymptotic normality was that the asymptotic variance of the M estimator took the following form. It had the sandwich formula from the limit normal distribution divided by the sample size. This formula is very much similar to our earlier results from the linear unobserved effect model for panel data, where we had estimators available in closed form. But in order to arrive at such a result, of asymptotic normality and a sandwich form for the asymptotic variance, we had to make use of an additional step, namely a linearization step. This linearization was not necessary in our earlier setting because estimators were available in closed form already. <laughs> now note here that the asymptotic variance of the M estimator depends on our Q function through the scores and Hessians. The scores enter B or B naught and Hessians enter A naught. Now we generally prefer estimators which have low variance, such that if we had multiple Q functions which could potentially be used to identify theta naught and therefore estimate it, we would choose the one that leads to the lowest variance of the two. Now one of the assumptions that we used in order to establish asymptotic normality was that this A naught matrix, which is the expected Hessian at the true parameter, was positive definite. Now, if we were to encounter a zero on the diagonal of this matrix, it would essentially mean that one of our, one of our estimators, or one of the coordinates of our estimators, had an infinite variance. This is this particular, this is a easiest to see in the case where we are dealing with a scalar parameter, since in that case, A0 inverse would simply be one over A0. That is, we're just trying, we're trying to divide by A0, which then would be us trying to divide by zero, which is not good. In the vector case, the problem here, a problem here arises from us trying to take the inverse of a matrix A0, which is not positive definite and therefore not invertible. Now a failure of positive definiteness of this expected Hessian essentially means that the population minimum, the population criterion function, is flat around theta0. But if it's flat around theta0, then theta naught cannot be the, the sole minimizer of the unique solution to the population problem. So a failure of positive definiteness essentially amounts to a failure of identification. Hence, these two assumptions are very much related. <laughs>
This ends our lecture on the asymptotic properties of M estimators, where we've given conditions for both consistency as well as asymptotic normality. So in the next lecture, we'll take a closer look at how one may estimate the asymptotic variance of the M estimator, which will then lead us to a discussion of inference.